Good morning, and welcome to day two of the Mental Health in Schools Conference. I'm Maria LaRose. I think those of you who were here yesterday know that already. And I woke up this morning with really a very warm heart, thinking about uh, and feeling about our day together yesterday. So I went back and reread the posts that you put into chat, and I was really amazed again at how much of a community this feels like this setting we're in right now feels like a community and more broadly just in British Columbia in general those of you who are working in this field of education and mental health I, I work at a, in a lot of different settings but I have to say British Columbia stands out you stand out um, as as uh, as the word came up yesterday with connection and and supporting each other the sun is shining here today um, and once again I'm grateful to live on the unceded traditional territories of Metsky, Quantum, and Casey, and Samyamu First Nations, uh, and walk along the Fraser River and look into the water, look on the water and see all the activity of kayakers and rowers. I know some of you rowers are watching today or just today. Um, campers and fisher people, and, uh, and then just look over and see the mountains as well, which are still this morning covered with snow or lots of snow. Um, I'm sure that you I hope you woke up rejuvenated too. And I also hope um, maybe a bit last night about, about our day yesterday and maybe even have a few conversations because that's really, as you know, how we make meaning of all that we're learning. Yesterday we heard from educators and youth, it's remarkable, researchers thought who all have a new perspective on promoting and maintaining mental health in schools. Um, so we took time yesterday as well to, to uh, reflect and connect. Well, we tried to connect. Today we're gonna connect, it's gonna work for sure. And then you shared a word that resonated with you around the question of um, uh, what is it that's standing out for me right now? And we, we took those words out of chat and we're gonna share them with you now just to remind you of what you said yesterday about what stood out for you at that point in the event. And, you know, most people know about these word um, pictures now that the larger words are the ones that showed up more often. So I'm not surprised at all that connection showed up as very large and, and as um, from our speakers yesterday it was standing up for you. Listen, it's great, connect, human beings, love. I'll just let you look at that for a minute. So there you are, there you are. Thank you for that. Thanks, Julia. Um, and, and today we're going to continue learning and sharing the, uh, a performance, a sharing that I know will inspire you. Naomi Tree is a drummer singer, and she attends North Island Secondary in Port McNeil. She's graduating pretty soon. She joins us now to share a special song that she chose specifically for you for this gathering. So please give a warm welcome to Naomi Tree Blossom. Hi. Gela Kasla Nugwa Um Netnagwas Naomi Khalasu Um Khaan Gayuchen Lach Gwaizdam's Glutulis Heum. So what I just said was um, welcome. My name is Nantnagwas. I am also known as Naomi. I come from Guilford Island and Alert Bay. The song I'll be sharing with you today is the Shawitsi's Farewell Song, which is from one of the tribes that I come from.
Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Naomi. And, and I wanted to mention that uh, if you live in or around Fort McNeil, on May 27th, Naomi will be featured in a concert with headliners, multi-platinum Juno Award winners, The Tenors. That's what Naomi will be doing, a benefit concert to support rural food security and uh, music programs. So you might want to just go up there to watch. Way to go, Naomi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we invite you again to use your note catcher. I'd love to know if these were useful for you. I'm sure for some they were. Um, they were for me, that's for sure. And you'll notice again, the first box of the note catcher uh, asks you, what is your intention for today? It might be the same as yesterday. Uh, it might not be, but you'll be able to consider that for the next uh, little bit while we um, share another grounding activity. This morning, we're guided by Lisa Bayless, who most of you know, she's among many other things, the author of Self-Compassion for Educators. Uh, she's joining us now. Here is Lisa Bayless. Thank you so much, Maria. Good morning. I'm joining you today from the traditional Algonquin People's Territories, also known as the Squamalt, Songhees, and Waysenek. And I'm really grateful to be able to take a moment to ground and land with all of you to help us move from doing to just being for a few moments. We spend a lot of our time being very busy as educators, going and planning and thinking and, and being in a really big, busy state. And so today my invitation is to practice slowing down and to move into a present state. Presence is our, our greatest gift that we can offer. We're often too busy to be present with one another, present with the work we're doing, present with ourselves. So we're going to slow down and I'm going to use the word slow as an acronym to physically slow us down for a moment, to ground, to be present, but also to arrive settled, to arrive lifted, to arrive open, and to arrive welcomed. And we're going to do that in, in a really settled and, and an alert state. So please take whatever comfortable posture that you may want. You can stay standard if you're neat, if you're standing, you can stay seated. I invite if it feels right to let things out of your hands, drop your pens. And if you wish, you can close your eyes, drop your gaze, or just keep your, you know, your eyes soft as we, as we start this practice. 
So we're going to start with this opportunity to soften and settle our body. So perhaps soften across your cheeks, your face, your jaw, down through your neck, across your chest, softening through your abdomen, into your hips, softening down your legs, into your feet, and letting this whole process be about sinking and settling. This invitation is truly to settle our body, to settle this physical body first so we can work towards settling our, our thoughts and our feelings. So giving some space to soften, sink, and settle into this moment right now, right here. Just notice the softening, but perhaps not a collapsing. So to avoid collapsing and invite an equally necessary alertness, I invite you to drop your shoulders, lower your shoulders and lengthen through your spine. This creates a beautiful sensation of lifting, lifting to our awareness. And it's in this beautiful balanced state, we allow everything to settle, but to expand at the same time. Joan Halifax calls this strong back, soft front. And as we lift, we take our awareness beyond our body and just allow this awareness to gather in, in this room, taking a moment to notice how your physical presence feels in whatever room you're in right now, as you sit here, as you land. Perhaps you may even be more aware of the sounds around you, the sounds far away, the sounds near you. And just letting that sounds come to you without getting caught up in a story about them. Just lifting your awareness to whatever exists around you at this time. This growing and present awareness lifts our attention without getting lost in it. We can notice the sensation of both being grounded and lifted at the same time. Grounded and expansive. And as we grow in this expansiveness, we begin to open. We open our awareness to whatever's going on. And perhaps maybe if it feels right to you, you may begin to open up to a breath into your body. The kind of breath that fills you up with whatever you need. And as you exhale, is releasing, letting go. Perhaps trying one or two of those breaths, these opening breaths. And allowing your breath just to Come back to however it breathes regularly. And allow yourself to continue to be open to any sensations that may be happening. Open to sensations in your body. Open to thought patterns, thinking that may be occurring if you might be noticing your mind's already wandered off. Our human minds love to do that. So just this beautiful invitation to come on back to feeling settled, lifted, open. Maybe when we slow down, sometimes we can be a little more open to any feelings that may emerge, noticing whatever bubbles up to our surface. This slowing down create space and in that space we can be more open to whatever is existing. Perhaps taking one more breath as you're being open to whatever's happening in this moment and then an invitation to welcome whatever's existing for you right now. Welcome yourself arriving just as you are, just as it is. This welcoming and connecting with our present self 
is an opportunity to really acknowledge and appreciate ourselves just as we are. Hmm. If it feels right, maybe you might even want to offer a little bit of warmth to this one too, this perfectly imperfect human being who's arriving here today. It may look like perhaps placing a hand over your heart and feeling the warmth of your hand. Just acknowledging this being in the room here. Maybe a word or two of encouragement you can offer yourself right now. There may just even be a sense of ease or warmth that you can welcome yourself into this moment. This present moment, this is what's existing right here, right now. This present moment being the greatest gift we can offer our presence. And as Maria said earlier, perhaps setting an intention to be as present as possible today. To be present in your learning. To be present through your interactions, both in person, online, and even in the interactions that you have with yourself. The kindest way we can offer our presence is to, to do this slowing down and to be really here with one another. So throughout the day, if you feel yourself being pulled away, allow that practice of slowing to happen. Settle your body, lift your awareness, open to the experience and welcome whatever's existing, whatever you're feeling, with kindness, with compassion, with care and with ease. As you go through this day, may you do so with the slowing down. Perhaps taking one more last really deep, juicy breath. Again, that kind that fills you up with whatever you need allowing your exhale to be releasing, maybe drop your shoulders one more time. And when you feel called to lift your gaze and ready yourself to go onward back into the day, I invite you to lift your eyes, come on back and go forward with that slow intention, however you need to be today. Thank you for practicing with me. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was exactly what we all needed. And Lisa's exactly. going to be joining us again later at about 10.30 uh, in her session about mental health in the classroom using self-compassion. What is compassion? What is empathy? So that's at 10.30. Right, so every, every corner of this province, educators such as you are working with students, families, and communities to find ways to support mental health and well-being in schools. And you are all doing that in a way that's suited to your communities, to your schools, to your students, to, to who you are as well. And just a moment, we're going to meet three um, mental health leads uh, from throughout British Columbia who are going to talk about some of the work that they're doing and um, some of the unique initiatives that, that uh, they hope will inspire you. And, and during that time, please feel free to uh, post your questions uh, into the chat. And as happened yesterday, I'll be watching this question and from both those questions uh, I'm speaking to uh, and to who you're about to meet. Um, so joining me now, you, um, maybe everybody could come up on screen uh, now, Heather, maybe that's a way to do it. There we go. You can see the names there. Irene Isaac is from a district principal indigenous Vancouver Island North. Hi, Irene. Claire um, McKay is Director of Instruction, School District 91 in the Chaco Lakes. And Vanessa White, District Principal, say and Healthy Schools, School District 62. Great, everybody. Can, I think it's probably a good idea to turn your microphones just on because it'll be more of a fluid conversation and you won't have to turn it on. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, Irene, you also sent along a slide and it would be great to look at that slide and tell us about what was significant about that for you. Julia, yeah. could you bring up the slide? Thank you. Uh, well, de la Kessler, uh, Nugo am weli la ogwa, ya ye kin la nam gis glu hakwa hakwa means. Um, I just said good morning and I'm so uplifted listening to our student Naomi share, you know, start us off in a good way. It, it's a good segue into what we're looking at here. Um, I hope that you can all hear me. I am at home and sometimes our internet is a little glitchy, so hopefully it's a thumbs up. Um, so the photo you see in front of you is basically our typical week. <laughs> this was my week this week in a way. So um, one of the things that we've we've um, done in our district is this year we offered a cultural and wellness program. So what that means is we have brought our traditional Kwa 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 ways of knowing and being and bridged it with what we have going on in the district right now. So some of the, the photos that you see, um, this is our Gyutsi here. Uh, that's which in our language, that means our traditional big house. And we have students who came to learn about um, our traditional ways uh, that we practice in our big house. Um, I know a lot of people uh, might think of culture as being mainly dancing and singing. But a lot of our, our practices also um, are around ceremony, which really help, you know, keep balance within our, our, our lives. So um, what you see here is one of our, our elementary schools joined us and they're learning about the circle and how we use that. And they were fortunate enough, we've just had our, our big house open. Uh, they were one of the first people to be able to be in there after the the pandemic so it was a really quite a special day um i'm not sure if this photo up here i hope you can see um this is one of our elementary schools welcoming another school to the territory uh, so they joined uh they came and they 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 came up actually to do a math class in this big house here and um we had our our alert bay elementary school welcome them which is part of Part of our practice when people visit us in our territory, we welcome them. Um, we say Gela Kesla, which means welcome. Um, also part of the culture and wellness program here is um, you'll see this young, young fella here. He's, he's mentoring an elementary school student and he's showing them how to do one of our traditional dances, which is a hamatsa. And you know, so so doing that bridging of our elementary school coming up into the secondary school. Um, and here we have a former grad student, you know, who is teaching weaving to one of our younger elementary school students. So all of those um, are, 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 are coming into our schools and, and bridging um, our Western ways, I guess you would say, with our traditional Kwa 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 ways. And um, a, newer, a newer step we took this year uh, which is fairly new is um, what we have, what we call our cedar brushing. I'm look, it's looking like I'm frozen here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. You can. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm almost wondering if I need to turn my video off Maria. Sure. Um, okay. We'll see what we need to do. Maybe we'll take the slide down and come back to you to you. Okay. Is that okay, Irene? Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I'm just when I'm Great. looking at myself, it looks froze, like I'm freezing. So I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. Let's let's okay. stay on the, the gallery view with all four of us, please, Heather. Okay. Oops. Yeah, so go. so uh, just to, you know, before I, I want to take questions if people have questions as well. But um, mm -hmm. one of the things uh, when I say culture and wellness, um, one of the things we've incorporated is our uh, brushing, which, which is uh, 
uh, we use cedar boughs to kind of brush and help when people are going through grief um, and water cleansing um, and burning. So like if we, we've, you know, if people have had loss, uh, then it's one of the practices our people used to do is in memory of their loved ones is burn some food for them and then have ceremony around that. So um, we actually have our staff coming into Alert Bay today, school district staff who are going to, our students have taken part in it. So now it's our staff's pro D day to, to join us in learning about what that's all about. So. I'm going to come back to that, Irene, because that's a question about how do you, how do you work as a community in terms of your staff um, to, to, so do you, do you mind if we come back and ask you more about that? I know today yeah. is an exciting day for you. Sure. You're waiting for everybody to arrive as we're talking. Yes, they're coming off the ferry. <laughs> yeah. I, I think your camera, by the way, is okay. You are freezing a bit, but um, but I, I, it's not distracting. It's it's fine. Okay. So if you can stay with us, that would be great. Uh, thank you for getting us started and launching right in mm -hmm. to doing. Claire and Vanessa, welcome to you as well. I wonder, Claire, if you could if you could. Um, give us a sense, and I'm curious about this with all of you actually, about how do you determine what the need, specific need is in your community with your students? So it's a question for all of you actually. Claire, if you wouldn't mind starting, um, yeah. because as I said earlier, you designed it for your needs. Yeah, thanks Marie, it's a really good question. And, and when you'd originally asked me this, I um, <clears throat> thought about it and the way that we looked at it wasn't actually necessarily we identified a need so what we did was we took the meant the compassionate systems leadership that lots of us in the province have done and actually looked at it through our youth so when many of our district staff and our principals did the course we were so um, engaged and impressed by the student voice the student ambassadors that we, we immediately said, we would like our young people to have those skills. We want them to be able to see those tools, to be able to use those tools in their daily life, in their schoolwork, in their contribution to the community. And so we didn't necessarily I say there was a need, we just knew that that was a skill set that we knew that all young people really should have because we were so impressed by that that work so that's kind of how we approached it so we um we looked at, and i think everybody's kind of familiar with the compassionate systems work but just the the tools that allow people to look at systems to look at the world around them to to be able to um work out what's going on for them, how they're reacting, how they're feeling in the moment, how somebody else is in the moment, and to consider those two sides, the powerfulness of that for our youth. So we decided that we wanted to bring that to them and we chose grade seven in our middle school as a, as a grade that we thought we would try that with. And um, we've got a long journey to talk about. And I don't know if you wanna talk about that Maria right now or just as it comes up, but for us, that was the way that we approached this, um, this work with the mental health grant. Let, let's talk, let's let Irene, Irene um, or I should say Vanessa jump in here first about the how did you decide? I think it's interesting that even my question has a negative bias, right? Has a deficit kind of bias. What needs did you determine as in what's broken? What you're telling me is no, you didn't look at it that way. You looked at it as what is the strength that's possible and that we could really um, build on here. So thank you for, for kind of illustrating <laughs> exactly the kinds of things we talked about yesterday. Look at what is there instead of what is broken. And in a minute, I wanna hear more about the systems uh, compassionate system thinking, how that applies to young people well, and older people too. Um, but Vanessa, do you want to just maybe address that question? How did you decide in your district what you were going to do? What would be most useful? Mm -hmm. uh, so our our focus this year has been on staff wellness. Uh, we've we've really come at it from that point of view that if we want to focus on student wellness, we also need to focus on the wellness of the adults in the system. Uh, we're doing things for students as well, but we've we've really focused heavily on our adults and our, our teachers in particular. Um, we used a, a report that came in from some focus groups that were done about three years ago with Charlie Naylor, uh, Cindy Andrew and Kim Weatherby. So we had Charlie and Kim come as a consultant group. Uh, they worked with different uh, groups of staff in order to get uh, really anecdotal and on the ground conversations about where people were at and what they needed. 
So they spent a great deal of time uh, working with those groups, hearing them, uh, having conversations like this, and, and getting a sense of what was, was truly needed. From that, they created this amazing report for us, and that's about the time I joined the district, and it was pretty much laid out. I, I kind of had my roadmap of what, what we needed to do that was requested by staff. Oh. Yeah, I'm 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 listening all over. <laughs> Thank you for that. And and again, we'll be interested to hear more details about what mm -hmm. you're doing. We're interested to hear even the process of decision making. Mm -hmm. um, do you you have a report and the report says something, but do you make meaning of that data with people? How do you decide uh, to who do you involve and you make yeah. a decision about what kind of um, uh, a process you're going to engage in? Irene, we'll come back to you, Vanessa, with that question. But I mean, maybe you could answer that question: Is it, who makes the decision? How is it made so that you make sure it is relevant for everybody? Uh, I think it's a combination. Um, in in our in our district, and I think in many districts across BC, we have uh, education First Nations education councils that help guide at least the Indigenous education uh, part of things. And one thing that we recognize is that our partners um, were offering these wellness, cultural and wellness opportunities, and they weren't having a great show up. But when they offered it in the schools. You know, you have your audience all there. And so we began to partner and rather than compete for our students, we actually worked together and uh, we had the same goals in mind. Um, and it's very similar. My answer is very similar to Claire, but the one thing and the sad reality is, is um, you know, we, we have a bit of a, our, our partners felt like we're in a bit of a crisis especially during the pandemic. Uh, we had a lot of uh, unfortunate loss. We've had, we had a lot of, um, you know, uh, struggles around uh, addictions and, and, and so on. So we worked together to try and, and, and you know, for, for thousands and hundreds of years, our, our ways of being and knowing has worked for us. So we thought, hey, you know, why not bring this into the school? It's always worked for us. And so far it's been, nothing but positive and I hope that we continue to build on the momentum that we have going right now so um yeah okay how about you what what's the process who do you involve and why um I mean I think that this particular project we really were specifically trying looking for a, a school that had some um, already had some skill base around working with our adolescents who had a who had a interest in developing that skill. We couldn't do it with every grade seven in the district for a beginning time for our pilot. So really, just finding the place that it fit most appropriately, because it is a journey, and we're we're learning from our mistakes and 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 going forward with strength. And so you need a team that's also willing to have some resilience around when it doesn't work as well. So. And were the young people themselves involved in the that those decisions or those you know deciding what to do or? No, actually, the young people were not. We we um, we decided that we would present it to them and that this is this is what we were going to be doing for this year. And um, so they've come along for the journey. They've given us lots of great feedback and okay. we <laughs> refined it for the next year. So the voice is really heard right now. But we said we decided the decision when we started was this. We feel this power in this. And I know that for lots of people who've done the compassionate systems, it's really hard to explain what the compassionate systems is and how it feels until you're in it. Right. Until you're immersed in it. It's really hard. And so we thought, how do you explain it to them without doing it? So that's kind of why we just said, we're gonna do it and then we're gonna see where we get to. So that's kind of where we're at right now, so. Yeah, that, I, I get that. And again, we'll find out more about that. But Vanessa, if you would answer that question about the process, who was involved, how do you, and why? Yeah, um, our process was, in terms of staff, was uh, the focus group process. So we had representatives from each employee group. Um, our our uh, teachers group joined a little bit differently. We have a, a health champ network. So very similar to the SOGI network where we've got a sort of a health and wellness rep in each school. And so feedback for anything that we do around uh, well-being is done through them. We, we, we meet 
uh, not as regularly as I'd like, unfortunately, with our TFC shortages right now, but we try to we try to get together and network as much as we can. And there's sort of that liaison between the district and the school uh, when it comes to, to staff on, on the site. The focus groups met with our QP group, our exempt group, and our PDP group uh, all separately. So they had time to really talk and share what it was like for them in their particular role in the district. Um, that's gone back and forth. We've we've uh, had their feedback come in. Charlie and Kim had a chance to sort of sit through it, uh, sift through it, and put it back in a report form, and then handed it back to them and said, "Is this what we really heard from you? Was this correct?" Before we hand this out to everybody, here's another chance to to look at it and say, "Is this right?" Uh, so it took a lot of time. Um, that amount of feedback looping, going back and forth, has definitely taken some time. As I said, those focus groups were probably uh, three years ago now, and we are just getting to some of the recommendations um, to be fully implemented. So. Yeah, the reason I asked that question is there is some evidence that the, the process you use to decide on something, the amount of collaboration you do, you know, leads to more success. If mm -hmm. you just decide something, hey, that looks like a good idea, let's do yeah. it. It's it's not as sustainable. And yeah. so I, I think just by seeing your heads nodding, that's been the case with you by involving people. Um, Irene, that kind of, or, yeah, that kind of leads me to the next, the next question, just describing a little bit about what's going to be happening there today uh, with you in the sense that one of the partners, of course, is the educators who are going to be implementing this program that, that you described earlier. So, you know, yeah, yeah, how do you I can do that share. Why do you do that? Well, I think it's important um, that uh, we're all in it together. You know, uh, when we're explaining to teachers, yeah, our students are away today because they're they're involved in a cleanse or they're involved in a burning. If 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 your teacher doesn't know what that is, they create their own stories of what that might be. Um, and it is it is an important piece of our ceremony. So it's important. Um, uh, I know sometimes we don't have the capacity within in our districts to do these things. So you know, we want we want our teachers to be able to be comfortable if they decide to plan or organize any of these. But also today, to be honest, a lot of our staff have had a lot of grief and loss in the last few years. A lot of them are in a way coming out of really a traumatic experience being in the pandemic. And um, they feel like this could help them. It could help ground them. It could help, help them with their process. It could help them with whatever they're going through today. And, and some, to be honest, it is, it's out of curiosity because they don't know what it is that we do sometimes. They hear about it and they know that our students want it and, and that it works. Um, so yeah, it's a mixture of things. So some will be involved in a cleanse today, some will be doing a burning, uh, and then we're going up to our big house to watch our youth uh, dance. Uh, and our, yeah, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be a really nice day. And, and it's the first day it's been sunny and like, six days so I'm so happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is kind of like what Claire said that in, it's one of those that until you've experienced it you really don't know what it is and and um and also part of what Vanessa is saying about adult well-being so it's it's all there in that package today and sunshine <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> um so let's let's dig in um a little more into the specifics of the initiatives that you're that you're involved with. And Claire, why don't you start by explaining to us what is Compassionate Systems? What is it? That's oh, your job. Oh yeah, though well, I'm not gonna do a very good job of that, Maria, but thank you, I will try. <laughs> so um, I know that the Compassionate Systems has been around in BC for a few years, and then it's part of our mental health and school strategy. So I'm really hoping that my poor um, explanation will just add to other people's understanding that they don't have it. So that's my hope. So um, for me, my understanding of compassionate systems leadership is the two pieces, the compassionate piece and the systems leadership piece. And so that that systems leadership, that we all work in systems and that we <coughs> excuse me, and that there are systems that are complicated, but there, there are tools and there are models to look at systems, to look at how they work, to see how we can make them respond better to the goals that we have as a system. And so and there are many different ways to look at that from small tools to large tools that will help us with the work that we're doing, but to look at that through a compassionate lens. So compassionate to ourselves, compassionate to the people that we work with, and also compassionate to the system and the people that we work with and serve in our, in our systems. And so there are 
you know, within the compassionate systems training, we learn lots of different tools that apply to lots of different scenarios, whether it's a we're just in a meeting and how to meet together in a generative field that feels like we're all contributing and that we all have a voice and we all belong to the bigger systems piece is to say this is how you know like looking at icebergs and what do we want to grow what is what is our aspiration that we want to grow as a system and how do we filter that all the way through our system to looking at our mental models and our artifacts and so lots of powerful tools for lots of different situations, but always through that compassionate system, compassionate lens, compassionate to ourselves and compassionate to our system. So that's my attempt at explaining compassionate system. So, <laughs> okay, show of hands on this, show hands on this screen. How many of you understood what she said? <laughs> okay. Good work so, there. And what, so how does that work? Like, how do you do that? How do you engage the young people and what do you do? Yeah, so so really, the when we we worked with the MIT team, uh, the youth ambassador team, to create how did first of all how do they already do that? They do it around the world already. So like, what are you already doing? How does that already work? And how is it going to apply to a group of 120 grade seven kids who live in Vanderhoof, who have a completely different experience to those student ambassadors in Switzerland and in Indonesia? Like, how do we bring that those tools to them? And how do we engage them in that work? And of course, the complications of the pandemic meant that that looked a lot different than, than it would have done it will do next year and it would have been and so you know that they bringing those tools really they they teach them in the same way that we do it as adults in the work right they immerse you in the tools and so they they start with all that the mindfulness the grounding the checking in uh, not too strange to our grade seven learners because our middle years already has um what we call a crew program working with our adolescents mm -hmm. Dr. Nancy Doder. And so for them, that was a very familiar piece. They were able to be like, okay, it's not that strange that that um, these people from all around the world, because the youth ambassador trainers are from all around the world in a different time zone, are coming and asking us to do that. And then we started teaching tools to them. We start, they started with the iceberg because it tends to be the one that that they start with and they for the for the youth. Um, and then we moved on to ladder of inference. And that's kind of where we got hung up. And so I mean I don't know if we want to talk about that now, but so really they taught the the youth that how how what an iceberg is and what it what it does. And then the teachers in the classrooms spent the next few weeks teaching the iceberg in different things. So this is a math class, let's talk about an iceberg here. Let, this, is a, um, this is a science class, we're gonna see how it applies here. And the teachers continuing to work with the MIT team through global calls and staff training on, okay, how do I put an iceberg into a, into a science class? It works a little bit better in literature, right? <laughs> when you do a novel study, but how do I do that in science? So that they were developing the skills so that the learners just get to practice over and over what an iceberg is. And it's and one of the things that we realized soon was that um, they we wanted to take it away from the iceberg is just what Gus and Rask do on the screen. An iceberg is something you can apply all the time. So that application piece has become really, really important because until the youth are able to really apply it, they're not going to be able to use it into any sort of meaningful way. So and then we taught them the ladder of inference. I don't know how many people know about the ladder of inference, but this was one that really spoke to the youth um, that talked about how you move up through a series of, of assumptions about the other person in front of you on their um, intent and what they might have meant and what's happening in the situation. I don't know how many of you work with adolescents, but for grade seven kids, they can get up that ladder really quickly. And so what we found was actually applying it to personal conflicts in the classroom or conflicts in the classroom, the ladder of infants actually had way more meaning to them than the iceberg did. So what's an example? So, you know, we got, let's say we have two youth who are having a, you know, often we're talking about friends, right? In grade seven, like my, they said that they did this, they've hurt my feelings, I'm gonna do this, right? And it goes, fumph, right? To, and we're all up here. And now we've got a gang of friends on either side and we're, and, and so really, we have a little ladder, a little blank one, and they work they work down with the teacher to the bottom and they say, okay, what did you make an assumption about? What did what do you actually know? And then trying to really bring it back down to, okay, what actually is the what is the situation here and how can we actually solve this in a different way? And that's actually proved to be really, really helpful for the staff. And the kids really understood the ladder of inference when it applied to them personally. So for us, that was a huge 
a huge piece because it already it started to give teachers tools to talk to the learners and the learners tools to talk to each other about conflicts. So we hadn't really, who knows why you don't think about these things. We hadn't really thought about it in the social realm. We'd really thought about it in a problem solving way. I mean, it, it is a problem solving way, but we'd never, but the minute they went there, we were like, oh, okay, well, that was, that was a great. So <laughs> that's kind of, we're still in the ladder of inference right now. We're using some other tools that the team is helping us with and practicing those because it really spoke to the, to the youth themselves and once they can hang on to a tool i don't know how many you know when you've done the course there's some tools that you just can't see how they work mm -hmm. but sometimes you just need to um be able to use them and then they have such practicality for you so i can't even know what the question was maria I'm... <laughs> <laughs> well i i just said tell us what it is okay, right. with you. no 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 <laughs> i just, just keep going and it's not fair i read in vanessa should tell you something <laughs> Well, yeah. we'll hear from everyone. We've got lots of time yeah. this morning, but I have some more questions, Claire, for you uh, and for you, Irene, too, about how did it work and what went wrong and all that. But thank you for that, because I think most people who are with us today know um, about compassionate systems, uh, for sure, because of the wonderful work that's being done across the province. It's, it's part of the whole plan. Um, so to hear how it's being used with young people is really interesting. So thank you for that. And you helped us understand how you're doing it, too. Um, Vanessa, tell us more detail about the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we were given a report with all of the focus group input from staff. Uh, our job was to implement the report and look at what, what we were going to do next. So a couple of them were, were super easy. Uh, we, we banged them off right away. It was you know, form a well-being committee, which we were able to do represent, representation from all of our groups. Um, have a look at some of the, the processes and policies that we have in the district. The, the big one that stood out uh, loud and clear from all employee groups and we were hearing it across the system was do something about email. Um, the email is email driving us crazy. Uh, the emails never stop. They come at all hours of the day. They come all weekend. They, they invade our life. Um, and it, it can honestly feel very overwhelming and it has a huge impact on, on wellness and well being. Um, we had Dr. Naidu come from uh, UBC to do a sleep session with the staff in January. So they met with all our, she met with all our health champs uh, and our school counselors and did a session around why sleep is important. And I thought it was going to be all on sleep. And she very quickly mm -hmm. moved it towards uh, electronics in the bedroom and, and that inability to disconnect and the impact that it has on our brain and our cortisol levels and just our general well-being. So our, our committee met and thought, you know what, this is a big one and, and we're going to tackle it. Uh, so we decided we would create an email guideline. Uh, we didn't want to call it a policy because we didn't want it to be top down. Again, we're trying to, you know, be mm -hmm. open and, and let people choose what they need from, from these guidelines. But we were hearing so loud and clear. People wanted some guidelines so that they had that freedom and that sort of, um, that permission to shut off when they needed to and to have a break from work. Uh, so we have been working on a draft and actually we presented the draft just last night to our leadership team to say, what do you think? And we're, we're waiting for feedback from them before we send it back out to the, to the larger uh, system. That being said, we've been, we've been working on this now for a year, um, going back and forth with feedback. So asking, you know, is this really a priority? What parts of this would be a priority for you? So what about email is, is driving you crazy? Uh, if we were to put something in place, what would suit your needs? What do we need to be thinking about for you as a particular individual within our system? Because it's very different for people who work different shift hours, right? Or it's different for people who are in those mm -hmm. emergency roles where they need to be on call and how do they get a break from email so taking all of that input we we've created a first draft um, it was difficult because we didn't have much to go on as a basis we sort of put the call out through through cindy and charlie and kim to say can you send us some samples where do we begin and all the samples that came back were all from business there there, mm. there weren't any samples in the education sector so it mm. was it was tricky but we think we've got a good first start and now we're in the process of waiting to hear what people think about it. Um, yeah, 
be really interesting um, to see I that. think I think when you said emails would be yeah, be really interesting when you said emails yeah. are a problem I think everybody became very interested in what yeah. you're saying because it's absolutely true what did you do about that what have, um, you, have well, you done anything we have done so we we did a little soft start uh, we just hired a new communications manager uh, right before spring break and uh, the Thursday before spring break she came into the office and said, wouldn't it be great if like we put out an email from head office from the school board office saying hey it's spring break you're gonna have two lovely weeks off please feel free to put uh i'm out of the office you know bounce back email on your on your email account yeah, what a great idea this is you know it's a good first start and it's gentle and people can do with it what they please anyways it, it took us a day to to sort of word it and you know we didn't want it again we didn't want it to be top down it was an invitation we mm -hmm. wanted to let people know it's okay to do this. We support you doing this. So it, it came from, from the school board office saying, please make sure you, you uh, think about putting one on and here's some sample wording for what you could use and enjoy your spring break. Well, yeah. we had so much feedback instantly. People were writing in saying, thank you so much. You know, this is really nice to hear that it's okay to do this. Um, I was gonna do it anyways, or, oh, I never thought to do it. We had lots of different uh, reactions. And even for myself, I have to say, I, you know, I, I wasn't going to put one on. I've never put one on before. I thought, what's the point? You know, the emails will just come anyways. And who, you know, who cares? But I thought, no, no, I'm going to jump in. I will walk the walk and, and do what I'm practice what I'm preaching. So I, I put my little email reply on and I'm the cert and vitra person. So mine had to be worded really carefully. You know, if this is an emergency, oh, yeah. please use my phone instead and put it on. Spring break started. And of course, a lot of my contacts being in the role I'm in are community partners. So they don't take spring break. So first thing Monday morning, the emails start bouncing in from all of our different community partners about mm -hmm. upcoming meetings and things to do. And I did, I, I, I felt this sort of lurch in my body of, oh God, right, I forgot to tell them I'm on spring, you know, I, I need to answer them or I need to let them know I'm off. Or, and then boom, as soon as their email came in, a little reminder came up, an instant reply has been sent. An instant reply has been sent. I thought, oh, oh, how lovely. You know, I like just, I felt lighter all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, I don't need to worry about it. Uh, they've been told I'm away. They've been told when I'm going to answer. And I don't need to do anything with this. I can just let it go. Wow. Yeah, Step it, away it. from the email. Yeah. And I did. I didn't answer a single email during spring break. Oh, good for you. It was lovely. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. I, I wonder, um, Irene, you, you've started to indicate to us already, Vanessa, what the results are of the initiative, what some of the results are, and, and I'm hearing well-being. I'm hearing some more mental health, and it's so interesting because it's a very, it seems to be kind of simple, but it's not. This mm -hmm. whole email thing is not simple. Irene, what are you seeing that makes you think that you're on the right track? What are you seeing with students? Um, what are you seeing with adults uh, as an outcome of what you're I think when a student says, I wish we could do this every Tuesday, <laughs> you, you know, that's the kind of feedback that you get and um, just the change, like when you're in our big house, or, or if you're in Umista, where we host a lot of Umista is, is one of the buildings that we're hosting at today and Umista means the return of something important. Mm -hmm. um, the Umista building, uh, our museum, it's more, it, it likes to be called a cultural center actually, houses all of our um, masks that were taken away during potlatch prohibition. So we, we have these there, but we have a cultural center to it. But when, when, our, when our kids are there, there's just a different, there's just the way they look, the way they behave, just there's such a calm and it just, it's hard to describe, but you can just see it and feel it. And this is where we offer, this is just one piece of a bunch of things that we're doing, but it's um, it's just hard to describe. It's just, you have to see them. It's in their face, it's in their behavior, it's in their being. Um, mm. You know, we, we always, our district uh, promotes Maya Hila, which is a respect for self. It's a respect for all things. It's respect for others. It's a respect for the land, the sea, the sky. And that's all part of our day and anything that we do. If you ask any student in our district what that means, 
whether they're indigenous or not, they could tell you what my Islam means. Mm -hmm. And when we're in those spaces, we, 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 all our teachings around that Mayakla, whether it's our academics, whether it's our um, language, whether it's our cultural and wellness, we all start with that idea of Mayakla. So that, so that, that starts the beginning of each of our sessions. But um, I know, I know that what we're doing is right because uh, you, you saw Naomi. <laughs> I mean, Naomi opened us off and when our kids, even when they hear that drum beat, it's just a calming. Like if you're, whether it's our log drum or even our drum, there's something in that, that just, you know, it's called in our language, we'd say das. It means to calm your spirit. And that's also one of the, the teachings that we have. And it's part of our enhancement agreement. We have these teachings around um, uh, salty dust, which is that calming and huhi lalas, like practicing, practicing that listening, um, listening, not just like with your ears, with your heart, with everything. Um, and dasla ichnoche means to carry a good heart. And that's all part of the teachings that we bring in. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting, everyone. I'm hearing there, I, I just made a note to myself is um, thinking about this idea of um, transformational social and emotional learning, which is a thing people are talking a little bit more about now. And that includes a belonging, identity, and agency at its, at its center. And I think what I heard in your story there was a sense for students of not just doing an activity because someone tells them to, mm -hmm. because that's allotted for that half hour of the day. And I'm hearing development of belonging, identity and necessity. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I would say that's an important piece. And uh, one of our elders, Adabira, certain um, and, and, and I purposely shared language with you today because uh, one of the things she shared, which, which is around what you're talking about belonging is without our language, um, what are we? It's all part of the teachings around culture and wellness. We're not Kwakwakiwak anymore. We're not Namgis. We're not Tlawitsis. We're not Danaktau if we don't have our language. And that's all when our kids hear our language or our singing, or they see an elder walking in our school buildings, they all look and they all, it changes them. They, they, they're just so proud to see that. So we're wanting to do more of that. And that's all part of this. We bring in our elders and residents. We bring in our uh, cultural leaders and um, language speakers. And it changes everybody in the building. It changes it, it, that pride. It's like, um, you know, the hoods come off, the heads go up, and it's, it's just a different, yeah. Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, you just said. Yeah, we it's we're not our programs are not secluded just to our indigenous learners. Everybody is invited. We all do it together. So it's you know we're fortunate to have a small district and we've all know each other. We're all interconnected. Um, when something happens, it hurt it, it it affects all of us, whether it's a birth, death, marriage, any of that, those types of things. We're we're a very close-knit district. So um, yeah, a model that is so for for any students. Thanks, Irene. Um, so I wonder that same question to you about like the proof is in the pudding. Is that the saying? What, what you you described what students are experiencing, and I, I gather that there's certainly some conflict resolution, maybe some skill building around that conflict because of the tools and the different um, mindset. What are you seeing and hearing from the students themselves around their mental health and well-being? Well, I think that for us, really, the 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 the, the proof of the pudding that we're that we're on the right track is truly that that we've been already we've been able to give them a tool and a skill that helps them to solve their their conflict and they're still going to need lots of guiding through that and they're still and some of them obviously doing better than others because you know we have a full range of of learners within our in our grade seven group there but we already see them using it and once they can already learn how to use a tool to support themselves in those conflicts particularly those personal conflicts they're already going to be able to have um better mental health in that situation. And so we're already able to see them talk about it, talk to each other, prompt each other about it, and ask the teachers for their help. 
And so that truly is giving them some skills. We've got a long way to go in this journey. And um, if you'd asked me at the beginning, I wouldn't have said that was the one that really would have captured their imagination, but that's what you don't know, right? Until you start. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that we've seen enough and the teachers have enough confidence that, that we're on the right track, that we're re-pivoting for next year. We've taken feedback from the learners, we've taken feedback from the teachers and we're re doing it completely differently next year for the next set of grade seven learners who will come in and then helping the grade eight teachers learn the skills so that they can keep moving that group forward. And so um, I think when teachers are asking for us to continue, it means that they're seeing something in those skill development for those learners. So for us, that's what we're using as our proof to keep moving forward, so. Yeah, and I guess the one of the, um powerful things about compassionate systems thinking is that the system is affected and that there's a, a more meta awareness of the fact that the system's being affected. So I, I wondered if students themselves have that, oh, I'm doing systems thinking or if they're just doing it. But I also wonder about um, what effect are teachers or the, are you seeing some systemic changes or effects? And that's a very bold statement for me to make that I probably wouldn't make at this point, but ask me in a couple of years and I might have a better statement for that. I think for now, you know, we're so still deep in the weeds of how it's working and what's working. And I think that the teachers, maybe I hadn't asked them that question and I, nobody said that, but I think it's early days for that. So ask me in a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, I just, I had a, theory, <laughs> a hypothesis that if students are able to solve their conflicts more, it probably makes for, a, you know, a, um, um, healthier environment yeah. in the classroom, for example. It's probably yeah. true, but you're saying you haven't checked that, so I can't put words in your mind. I mean, that's my guess based on what people have told me, <laughs> but I, you know, it's a bold statement, so we'll just hang back on the phone for a while, Maria. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you because you are being watched by millions. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa, I'm wondering too what the impact, and you've talked about the impact on yourself and other teachers around that, that uh, very concrete action of of slowing down those emails or saying no to emails. Um, what kind of an impact are you expecting or seeing? Anything else you wanna share that's become, that's positive, even about being part of this process? Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I've seen impact on, um, it's filtering slowly, I think is, is what I would describe it as. It's very, as you say, Claire, it's early days. Um, it was really heartening. We, we did a bit of a feedback session with our leadership crew right after spring break to say, what was that like? What did it feel like? Did you enjoy it? Um, did anybody have any problems? Because some people did have problems with it. You know, a, a lot of people spoke about, but my time off is when I get to my emails. And that's what gives me wellness mm -hmm. is being able to stay on top of things by using the time I want to do my emails. And it was this, this guideline is not meant to tell you that you can't work when you want to work. It's giving you the ability to disconnect if you want and putting practices in place that allow others to be disconnected from you. Mm -hmm. So a really good example, and I, I won't use names, but somebody you know who, who has a fairly high up position in our district gave their feedback and said um, it was it was really annoying it said because I sent out an email in the first week and I got like 400 replies back saying I'm out of the office yeah. and it was silent <laughs> and everybody went yeah exactly <laughs> so it, it it's I think it will build slowly um I, I think we're seeing gratitude for it and it's by by no means perfect and like I said we're in first draft stage right now and even sending out the first draft we've we've had feedback from people saying well you've set these hours does that mean that I have to be available now during those hours even though my shift ends two hours prior to that and it's like no no it's not what we're saying we're just mm -hmm. saying these are really good guidelines that between these times it's great to send emails outside of these times be with your family be with your friends be with yourself and and disconnect from work there you know give yourself that that time so I would say it's just even an awesome opportunity to recognize your relationship with emails. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you don't put that email up right away and you're uncomfortable with it, note, note, I would note that about myself and say, well, that's very interesting that I can't yeah. go a day without checking my emails with a extreme anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. 
We, we added other things in there as well about just guidelines in how we use email. So, you know, when to use the CC, um, mm. expecting who to reply. How do you, how do you denote who's supposed to reply? Um, and we've really focused this first draft on, on in district. So between colleagues, our next step, this is what we would see sort of down the line is working out to that broader system of our parent community. And so we've we've just started that a little bit with uh, one of our guidelines being, you know, what's reasonable to expect for a reply? Because nothing feels worse than getting that email back from someone saying, I see you haven't replied and they've CC'd your supervisor, right? Um, it's a horrible feeling. If you go, oh, gosh, I haven't, I haven't replied and now my boss knows I haven't replied and, and it sends up the anxiety as well. So what is reasonable and how many hours is it okay to sit and wait? Um, the other one was the we and we heard this from so many different people was the the 4 p.m on friday email mm -hmm. that's kind of vague and says i re, i'd really like a conversation with you next week mm -hmm. and then the person sits with that all weekend you know saturday sunday thinking is this bad news am i in trouble have i done something wrong is there conflict and so even though they may not be reading or doing anything about that email that weekend yeah. it, it's sitting with them and it's causing unwellness so we get that's that's very the term specific. For those, yeah, apparently the term for those is sniper emails. So we're we're oh. we put that in there. No sniper emails yeah. and no vague emails yeah. about we need that text. That text. Can we talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why? Uh, thank you for that. You you've um there's a lot one of things I asked. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying there's a lot of work to put into that. I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So do the people in our chat as well. Um, so we have just about four minutes left or something like that. And I wonder if we could uh, just think about maybe even one lesson learned, because of course, everybody who's joining us is listening and thinking, I I'd love to do that. Or so, so Irene, maybe with you, what is a lesson learned about that, that uh, you'd like to pass on to others? Um, I think it's uh, the one thing that's really helped me is connecting with our local nations. Um, because they have resources available through First Nations Health Authority, uh, First Peoples Cultural Council that you may not have available at the district, uh, but they really want to partner. And sometimes if you don't make those connections, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started this position, I thought I had to do it all on my own. <laughs> but there's actually a whole bunch of partners we have who actually want to help. And they have the same goal and the same intent. So um, that's been a big that's lesson great. for me. That's yeah. great advice. Thank you. Claire, one piece of advice or one lesson learned. One lesson learned that um, just got to keep trying. That the first idea, I mean, the grand idea that we all had when we all sat down together with School District 42 last May with all, with our principal, with the team, and we had this great idea and we laid it all out and we're like, we are awesome. We know how to do this. Yeah, no. And so it didn't work anything like that. And so just be willing to just keep changing and keep changing and just create those, those, the new things that come up, just create new challenges and new adventures. And because it was a good idea and it is a good idea and we're seeing the results just, yeah, don't, don't give up. <laughs> it takes time. Thank it you for takes that. Time. Vanessa. Yeah. I hear that from all of you actually. Vanessa. Yeah, that would Lesson probably learned. be mine is the don't be don't be scared to take time to do it well and to slow down and get that feedback at each at each and every step. Um, I was I was chomping at the bit last June to get this out and let, let's just get it out. So it looks like we've done something and we can mm -hmm. report on something. And there's this need to to have something tangible very quickly. And when you rush it, um, you you often run that risk of of getting it wrong. And so the yeah. the slower you can do it, and the more feedback you can ask for, the hopefully the closer to the target you're going to get. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, I can see by that, that people really appreciate you sharing. They can identify with a lot of what you're saying. Mostly, just want to say thank you. And if you meet me over the weekend, you won't get me because I'm going to try doing one of those automatic replies on Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank I you. Do. I hope you stay with us for the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Gayla Kessler.
There we go. Um, so um, I, I can see that you saw that it was really fascinating. There are your colleagues doing the work that many of you are doing as well. And wouldn't it be great if we could hear from all of you about what you're doing? Um, now in our next session, we're going to introduce you to some new reflective tools. We've talked about big ideas here and here are some tools that will help guide educators in um, building and strengthening relationships and well-being and mental health for all. These tools are the result of um, the work that's being, the work uh, that was recently done by the group that um, Minister Whiteside talked about yesterday, that is the, the Ministry of Education and Child Care's Mental Health Working Group with representatives from BC Teachers Federation and the Independent, and the, sorry, BC Teachers Federation and the Federation of Independent Schools Association. So that's a mouthful you can hear, but here to tell us more about what all that means and, and uh, the work of the working group and the new resources. Please welcome Suki Davis and Shirley Drew. Thank you. Hi, I and you can take me off, Heather, there we go. All right. There, I need to see him see it, yeah. So good morning, honor colleagues. I am, I'm really happy to present um, this opportunity that Shirley and I had to participate in this twofold project. So I just will give a little blurb in, um, introduce our experience and then um, leave it to Shirley to really explain these two tools which we've created in the project. So our first step was to share our experience with the, um, the Ministry of Education, how we had experienced um, supporting mental health and well-being in schools during the COVID pandemic. And these listening sessions then led into this collaborative work where the representatives from BCTF and FISA reviewed and developed these teaching and curriculum resources to support mental health and well-being through all the environments of learning. So you're seeing here these emojis of the 11 participants and our gentle leader, leader Katie Winship. And so collectively, we have about 150 years of experience in BC classrooms. And you might consider all of us to be mental health zealots. We were really excited actually to lend our skills and energy to create an education system that supports learning and well being. And we work together in a beautiful, co creative manner to build upon those key principles and strategies for K 12 mental health promotion in schools and to clarify how those four key principles of cultural responsiveness and humility, proportionate responses and supports, trauma-informed practices and strength-based practice support mental health and well-being in BC schools. And as we work to build upon these four key principles and connect them to the first people's principles of learning, to professional standards, to curriculum, to assessment and reporting, and to amass a huge volume of resources, we reflected on the idea that to develop a pervasive culture of caring and belonging, everyone has to be included. And so the document was written in the plural first person, we. We did that really consciously. And in the iteration of our conversations, we kept coming back to something that resonated for all of us. And that was how staff and student well-being are entwined. So how do we develop a culture of collective care? We asked ourselves. And we created this tool for a reflective process, which Shirley will share. Thank you, Suki. I'm just going to get us back to there because I accidentally hit my forward button. Um, while I'm doing that, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm presenting today from my home on the traditional unceded territories of the Simk and Clayton Tanay peoples uh, here at the headwaters of the Fraser River in the Rocky Mountains. It's a pretty beautiful spot. And I am privileged and honored every day to be able to call this place home. So Suki, I'm just gonna get this done, but I- Sure, I, I, I felt in, the, in our time constraints too, I really want, want to acknowledge um, my gratitude to work and live here on the Sinemoch territory and um, raise my hands to the Sinemoch people for their care of this land. Thank you. So as Suki mentioned, uh, we were so excited and privileged to be a part of this working group uh, on behalf of uh, mental health in our BC schools, both independent and public. Uh, as part of the work that we did, one of our groups, as Suki mentioned, really focused on that document, that the 11 key principles document that came out uh, when we were looking at our startup coming back from COVID. 
I happened to get to be a part of that group. And it became obvious fairly quickly that when we're considering those first four key principles, the cultural responsiveness and humility, proportionate responses and supports, trauma-informed practice and strength-based approaches, um, we recognized quite quickly that these really share um, a fundamental, like a common foundation, um, like a similar foundational capacity, which is really how do we own what is ours? So our perspectives, our biases, the ways that we're showing up, um, how do we hold, create and hold these spaces that really prioritize the flexibility that each of us needs both to allow for multiple interpretations of behaviors of other people in the spaces where we are and to allow for the possibility, um, I'm saying, and I'm using the word possibility very generously, the possibility that we might not have as an individual all the information that we need to make uh, an informed decision that is really going to um, build and sustain those generative social fields that we really hope to, um, to have in our classrooms, in our schools, in our districts, um, in, in each of our different spaces where we're coming together. So with that in mind, um, we decided I like to make pictures. Um, so I, I volunteered to like, I think I could probably, you know, maybe turn this into a picture and then let's, you know, work on that simultaneously. So in our group, it kind of became this two track process of um, going through the document and then also developing this infographic. infographic. And that's in addition to the work of the other piece of our larger group um, who were working on scope and sequence documents. So this, um, image and the next image I should mention are still in draft. So these are draft ministry resources. So I'm so I think I'm supposed to ask you not to screenshot it, which I probably should have done before I shared it. So sorry about that. Um, I'm new to this and very excited. So, you know, a bit scattered. So basically the way that this particular picture came about is thinking about, um, as I mentioned, how do we build these spaces? How do we hold space that are, that's going to honor that diversity, the strengths, the struggle, whether it's seen or known or not, um, in ways that really invite participation and, and celebration of these shared spaces. How can we see each other and, and, and celebrate each other? Um, how do we move from control to connection, which is something we heard again and again yesterday? And um, how do we celebrate each other, not in spite of our differences, but because of them? So, um, from this, the first place where my mind went, as it often does, is how do we help support the, these gaps, these gaps, as Viktor Frankl would say, between stimulus and response, where we have that space to make a, to make a choice. So instead of just reacting, um, we're able to respond. Um, I, I, once upon a time, uh, did some training in a structure called the Neuro Relational Framework. Uh, which is a beautiful framework. I'm happy to talk at length about it, but not here today. But in that document or in that framework, um, a, a big a core principle is getting to green. So it's a dyadic um, method for caregivers and children, but it's also definitely applicable to um, adults anywhere that we really are trying to help co-regulate each other. And in that, that's why this is called a map for getting to green. So how do we get to that space where we're able to co-regulate each other? So looking at this center here, um, as we heard yesterday, as we heard this morning uh, with the work from that Lisa uh, shared and is going to share again later today, when we're able to first see what's going on for us uh, as an individual in that space, that's really going to be key to then having that choice in responding rather than reacting. So whether you're a secondary science teacher between blocks um, and you only have that five to 10 minutes or whether you are about to go into a meeting with your staff um, as a school principal um, or whether you are about to have a bargaining meeting um, which is particularly salient to some of us at this moment. If we're first able to take that moment to check in with ourselves, make sure that we are aware of how we're showing up that is then going to give us a lot more flexibility in how we're able to take in information and in what kind of information we might be sharing through body language, um, through our presentation of you know, facial expressions and just kind of that general energy that we're bringing into a space. So that's sort of why we started with the center here. Uh, also connected to this neurorelational framework, we can see we have some hands at the bottom, we have a heart, and part of that neurorelational framework is this idea of head, heart, hands, uh, which 
like the starting with yourself, which is one of the three pillars of compassion systems leadership, um, is, is also connected to compassion systems leadership, um, which I'll get to here shortly. So we wanna make sure that we are thinking about what we're doing. So the head, we wanna make sure we have care for ourselves and, and each other in what we're doing. And we wanna have action. It's, it's all well and good to think about it and care about it, but if you're not gonna do anything about it, um, it's, it's not ever going to help us make things the way that we might envision them. And then finally, there is also that reflective aspect in this neurorelational framework. With that model specifically, it's talking about making the space for individuals and families um, with agencies and then with um, larger systems. So again, very much connected also to compassionate systems leadership. Some of you might recognize this inner ring here. Um, and this inner ring where it says, am I modeling? This is taken from internal family systems. And the intention of this particular group of words is meant kind of for twofold practice. One is um, for personal reflection. So if we can think about um, what am I bringing into this space? Am I able to, you know, Am I able to model calm? Am I able to model connection um, with my students or my colleagues? Because notice this is not teacher student language. This really is a tool that we, uh, as Suki mentioned, developed deliberately to be useful across contexts and with, with various groups of pe people. Because um, if we're not able to be supported as adults in the space, it's really difficult to then provide that support to, ch to children and students. So this ring here can be used either in a reflective capacity to think about how am I showing up, what do I want to bring, or it can be used um, in a planning for planning tools. And when we are using it in a planning capacity, it can really help us with, um, you know, these principles of UDL. It's not an exhaustive list. I feel that that's important to, to uh, share. So this is from internal family systems. They call it the eight C's, but it's not meant to be the only qualities that we that we're bringing, that we're sharing. Um, these are meant to be some of the qualities that we are able to bring and to share when we are in green. So when we're able to be in that regulated space. Um, it can also help us reframe what others are bringing. So where we might have a, a student or a colleague where we maybe are looking a little bit at them and thinking like, oh, you know, why are they so um, outspoken, maybe they're modeling courageousness. And often when we are able to reframe, we're also able to then have a bit more compassion for what other people might be trying to bring in the space. And then finally, this outer circle here with the questions, again, those are to help, help us reflect when we're planning on some kind of, any kind of shared space where we really want to, again, build and sustain these generative social fields um, where we know that everyone is going to feel comfortable showing up with their whole selves in ways that they are able to be seen and where they are able to recognize that they are valued, um, whether it's students, whether it's staff, whether it's colleagues, um, whether it's community partners. And then these double-headed arrows, also very important. We wanna keep in mind that all of this work is always done within these larger pictures, these systemic factors, the contexts, the cultures within which each of us from which each of us come and within which each of us live, um, exist and share um, our aspirations. <sighs> I have a ton of connections from yesterday that I don't think I'm gonna have time to get to because I also wanna talk about our second slide. But in general, um, this is partly um, to recognize or to start maybe signposting one of the ways that we can start working towards uh, what Jean Clinton called that pervasive culture of caring, um, which we could also think of as that model of collective care. So I'm just going so to our second picture. I'll Did just have... talk and introduce the, the second slide is here again, um, one group had a lot of success creating that scope and sequence that describes how mental health can be brought into PHE and other subjects. But we really wrestled with social and emotional learning. And we realized social and emotional learning infuses all areas of the curriculum. So we created this where social and emotional learning is not an add-on or something on a curricular plate at all. It's the plate itself. So please explain. 
So we have about 10 seconds. Uh, in those 10 seconds, I would like to point out that this is a very fun metaphor. There is a lot you can do with this metaphor. And with both of these images that we're sharing, we've actually also developed second pages. So they're meant to be double-sided or top and bottom on an 11 by 17 poster um, that really provide more of the context, more reflective questions, how to use these documents. Um, and very important, also highlight the fact that this is none of this is meant to be uh, used to further responsibilize an, any particular individual within a system. It's meant to help really um, build those factors, support those factors of first people's principles of learning, where we recognize that learning is very relational. It's meant to support well-being. It's meant to be reflective, and it's meant to include an awareness of what we are bringing to the table. So I am very happy if you want to put things in the chat to connect later. Again, we can't share these yet officially, but um, very happy to have been here and thank you for having us. Thank you so much. You're back. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Hi. I rebooted during the uh, your presentation because I understand there's some audio problems for me and I apologize for that. I think it's because they're mowing the lawn outside. Not very highly tech. But I wanted to say that, uh, thank you so much to Suki and Shirley and to say that um, there was one question that was about the timeline for when people are going to be able to get that infographic and, and these resources. So perhaps you could answer that in the chat because people are really wondering about that. But Shirley and Suki, thank you. And um, hey, why doesn't somebody give me a thumbs up? Is my audio better now? Am I still annoyingly? Oh yes, it was the lawnmowers. Very grateful for that, that it's being mown, mowed, but not today. <laughs> I wish I could have done something about that. All right, changing, changing pace right now. So every year, Orange Shirt Day, as you know, September 30th opens the door to global conversations about the effects of residential schools and legacy and the legacy that they left behind. Orange Shirt Day honors the experience of Indigenous peoples, celebrates uh, resilience, and affirms a commitment to every child matters. Phyllis Webstead is the creator of Orange Shirt Day, and we're so fortunate that she is here now uh, to tell us her story in her own words. Please submit any questions you have uh, in, in the chat, and when I join Phyllis later, we'll address your questions as much as we can. So please welcome now Phyllis Webstead. Mm, thank you for that intro. I will uh, bring up my PowerPoint. I present with pictures. A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, okay, so participants can see. So Wade Hochweda, Phyllis Webstad Rensquest, Stwachem Chatstum Stlekwen. What I said is hello to everyone watching. My name is Phyllis Webstad. I'm from the Kenu Creek, Dog Creek First Nation. I am coming to you today from Shuhwatmuch Uluch, the land of the Shishwa people in Williams Lake, BC. We moved our office onto the Williams Lake First, Na First Nation band lands at the end of March. <clears throat> I have a half an hour today with uh, 15 minutes of this uh, question and answers uh, afterward. And so I will talk very quickly and move very quickly to try to uh, give as much information as I can. Starting with, uh, uh, sorry, something fell on the floor. Starting with my books, uh, The Orange Shirt Story. All of my books have curriculum with them uh, for every age group. Uh, my publisher's website is medicinewheel.education, medicinewheel.education. You can look uh, and see what's available there. The picture in the middle is me when I was six years old at the mission, otherwise known as the St. Joseph Mission Indian Residential School, where three generations of my family attended. And it's just down the road from where I am right now, actually. Uh, about three minutes or so. And on the right is my book that came out telling gen six generations of my family story beyond the orange shirt story. And I'll read a bit about it um, later on. This is uh, a picture of my traditional territory, the Fraser River, 
flows into the Pacific Ocean in Vancouver. I spent summers here as a child with my grandmother. Uh, my mother was too traumatized to take care of me. Uh, so I grew up with my grandmother until I was 10. And when my aunt uh, took me, so spending summers here, we fish at nighttime. And in the morning, we get up and cut up the fish. This is called Lillooet style. It's not our traditional Shawetmuk style. The traditional Shawetmuk is you open the fish out and you put sticks in it. This is uh, the uh, Stetlunk style. They are a few twists and turns down the river. This is my son, Jeremy. He's uh, fishing in the back eddy. This is during the day. We go down and claim our spot for the evening. This is uh, one of two styles of fishing. One is you stand on the banks with a dip net and you fish. We are a dip net fishery. We do not use gill nets by choice. And the other is to set and um, fish in the back eddy and uh, you tie up your net to the rock. You can kind of see the, the rope there. And this is Granny's house that I was born in. I was born on July 13, 1967. So to save you the math, I'm turning 55 this year. This is a Department of Indian Affairs matchbox house. Uh, no insulation other than a bit on the top. It was just board walls. In the winter time, the frost would come halfway up the walls. It was so cold and our blankets would get stuck to the walls. We didn't have electricity or running water. We, to keep food, we had a cellar dug into the hillside. That's where we kept the food that we gathered from the land, berries, um, salmon. Uh, Granny had three gardens in the area. We did not have the money or the means to get, like we do today, to Walmart or to save on and, and we had to rely on what we could gather from the land. And the way Granny made money is she um, tanned hides, mainly deer. They were easier and would made, make buckskin gloves and vests and coats and beat <coughs> them and sell them at the local general store to tourists. And that's most likely how she got the money to buy me that orange shirt to go to school on my first day. Uh, the Shushwap word for uh, Daw Creek is Khatlam, Khatlam, meaning deep valley. You can see on one side is hillside and we're standing on the hillside. And in the Caribou Chalcotin area here, uh, reserves, there's usually ranch reserve and, and, and ranch, which is the case here. So we were stuck in the middle of uh, two prime areas of land that the ranchers got and that's usual in, in our area. So that's, uh, I could talk more about what it was like as a child before I went to residential school, but I have a lot more material to get through and stories to tell. Uh, perhaps maybe I could come back and talk to you in person at some point and, and uh, give more of my story. Just a, a little bit about how Orange Shirt Day started. The first Orange Shirt Day was September 30th of 2013. It came about when the TRC came to Williams Lake. We were preparing for that in May of 2013 and I wasn't working, I didn't have a boss of me. <laughs> so I was able to attend the planning meetings and I ended up telling my Orange Shirt story really for the first time. And from there, uh, was uh, Orange Shirt Day was created. Originally, it was for the Caribou Chalcotin area in Williams Lake to have the conversation at least once a year about the history of, of St. Joseph Residential School, about the mission. It was in response to Murray Sinclair's uh, call, challenge to Canadians to keep the conversation happening after the TRC wrapped up. And as we all know, that ended, uh, the final report was in 2015. This book was created in 2020, uh, tells the story of Orange Shirt Day, uh, 
Uh, I didn't just get out of bed one day and decide that Orange Shirt Day would be September 30th. There's a long line of people, a long line of events that took place, and it happens to be my story. We chose September because that's the time of the year that the children were taken from their homes and their families. We chose the 30th because we wanted teachers time to settle in to teach the students the history, and we wanted time to plan an event. We uh, chose Every Child Matters uh, when we were talking about we need a catchphrase or a theme. It was uh, to do with how I shared that I felt during that one year at the mission that I did not matter. We could cry ourselves to sleep. We were hungry. We were there were no adults to make anything better and five and six year olds should not be comforting each other. And so that that's what was happening. And I was a newly six year old and my cousin Barb, she was five years old. She turned six in, I believe, October, but we were we were young children. And the uh, it went uh, viral thanks to this woman, Shannon. The story is in our book. But uh, at the September TRC event in Vancouver, uh, her and some survivors handed out little four by six cards like this. And I had forgotten about my conversation with Shannon. And uh, I didn't ask her what her plan was when she asked me if she could help me make this go viral. And I was having a hard time too, because I had never really connected the residential school history with my healing, on my healing journey. And anyway, I was in Vancouver mid-September before the first orange shirt day and somebody handed me a four by six card. And I read it and I was looking at it, I was like, what? That sounds like me. What is going on here? And it took a couple of hours. I still get the shivers when I talk about that. It took a couple of hours to realize, I bet you it was Shannon. Sure enough, she had created a Facebook page and they were handing out, they had 5,000 of these cards, handing them out at the Vancouver event. And from the very beginning, and I'm still getting shivers, is that the whole Orange Shirt Day movement, everything to do with it has been divinely guided. The ancestors, shivers again, and the children are behind this whole movement. There's no other explanation as to how it would get to the point that it is today. And as we know, last year was the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and uh, September 30th, and it, it will continue to, to be that. One day there will be no survivors left in Canada, but uh, Canada will have September 30th. The In the front cover, when you open the Orange Shirt Day book, is the map from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of all of the residential schools in Canada. And when you turn the page, there's uh, talks about all the denominations. Uh, the one that I attended was Catholic. Uh, it was run from 1891 to 1981. So in Williams Lake, uh, survivors are 40. My son was born in 81, so he just turned 41. So 47 years old and older. Survivors' children in Williams Lake are still in the elementary and high schools here. On the left-hand side is my cousin Barb that I mentioned earlier, and the second picture that exists of me when I attended the mission. The building is no longer there. It was torn down in the... Uh, the early 1990s, we figure about 1993, there were five nations that attended the mission. There was the Shawatm or the Shushwap, the Chalkotin or the Chalkotin, the Deketh uh, carrier, the Statlam uh, from Pemberton, Whistler, just outside of Vancouver, 
Lillooet area, they were brought in by rail car. So what you don't see on the side is a railway. So they were brought in by rail. And also the Nuhal came here, uh, people from Bella Kula and Bella Bella area. On the left-hand side is, was the boy's side. On the right-hand side was the girl's side. And when my aunt uh, attended, my, my aunts and uncles, there was actually a fence that divided them. They could not talk to, the girls couldn't talk to the boys, even their brothers. To visit, they had to pretend to be walking the fence to even, um, even have a visit with their own siblings. And, but when I was there, you can see there's a, uh, a play swing set. We were able to play on the grounds together. We still ate and slept separately, however. And coming here from the reserve with no electricity and maybe a radio every now and again, it was very loud. When I was here, there were 272 students. And one of my memories is of eating eggs. So you can imagine everybody with a bowl, everybody with a spoon. You have eggs in your bowl and you're all chopping and talking at the same time. It was deafening. And I got to tell that story to my aunt and my grandmother. My aunt was working on a book for Tecumseh Loops Residential School. That was the other residential school in Shuwetmuth or Shushwab territory in the south. And um, anyway, my aunt was working on this book and we were talking and I told my egg story. And when I finished, Granny's response was, you had eggs? And it just, every time I say that, it just breaks my heart. That she was there for 10 years, 1925 to 1935 and never had a single egg to eat. And my aunt was giving, um, her testimony because they recently, um, uh, with the ground penetrating radar, there's 93 graves and my aunt, I was with my aunt giving her testimony of what she knew. And um, she got me to tell that egg story. And when I was finished, she told the interviewers that she as well did not have an egg. And I forget the year she was there, but mom was there from 54 to 64. Mom is older, so it would be um, even more recent than that. In the back was a Catholic church. And for a place that was there for a long time, there's not a, not, not a lot of pictures. The upper left is the only picture I can find of the church. The lower right isn't of the mission. I found it online, but that's what our beds would have looked like, just rows and rows of beds with the pillars the supporting beams in the middle. Uh, this is what the ground looks like right now. The tree would have been on the girl side where uh, we would have entered every day. And when I was there, we were bused into Williams Lake into public school. So everyone uh, attended public school. No one went here to the mission. Uh, this is a picture of Granny, the year that she left in 1936. So she went to 25 to 35, 36. And there was no graduating. It, it was either grade 10 or when you turned uh, 16. The way Granny would have gotten there was by horse and wagon. And these are actual pictures I found online. So the children would be brought in in Granny's time on wagon or by horseback. And the cross country, it would take like a, a week basically to get from the reserve to where the mission site is. And when granny attended, like half of the day was um, cooking, sewing, that sort of thing. Granny was a very good knitter. The boys would cut wood. And of course they, their heat was all, um, all wood heat. In the low upper left is the way that it was when Granny was there. Uh, so all of Granny's 10 children attended. And my eldest aunt uh, talks about in the book, she's in here, that she moved uh, to the new building in the lower right. And so that's the way it looked when I was there. 
This is my mother. She attended from 1954 to 1964. And she was uh, very impacted by her experience and the times. Um, uh, Mom was told by the Indian agent to leave the reserve when I was born. She was 20 years old, that the Indian agent would not, or the government wouldn't give her welfare. And she wasn't even expecting welfare, like they lived off the land, but it was starting to become about money. and. Um, so mom left and I have her permission to say she became an alcoholic. And um, this year, I'm gonna get choked up, is her 30th year of sobriety. She lives in Kamloops, about three and a half hours south of me here in Williams Lake. Uh, she'll be 75 this year and I'll show you an updated picture of her later. The way that my mom and my aunts and uncles got to the residential school was by cattle truck. This is of the uh, Southern Shoghatan, the children in the cattle truck. And my, my eldest aunt talks about in, in the book about how uh, as a six year or as a child in the back, uh, there would be a nun with them. Uh, so you can imagine only speaking Jean, Shushwap, then this funny looking person is talking a different language and the nun made them pray Catholic prayers, the two hour drive into Williams Lake. Well, maybe back then it was a little more than two hours, but I ever thought if there is, uh, if I ever do a movie, that's going to be one of my, um, one of the scenes in the movie. This is Granny, the woman that bought me the orange shirt. Granny lived to be 100. She passed in January of 2019, and we miss her dearly. Granny uh, was Catholic her entire life, and as was her mother. And beyond that, I'm not sure if... Um, Granny's grandmother would have been Catholic, but um, I have the time to tell the story about, um, I grew up here in Williams Lake. I moved away to go to school, to get education, and I worked in various like government. And anyway, I moved back in 2004. We have been in the BC Treaty process now for 28 years. And in 2004, when I moved to the reserve, we were right in the thrux, or if that's even a word, in the middle of talking about the chapters of the treaty, like health, education, um, roads, and those kinds of things. And we would have community dinners, usually in the evening, so everybody could attend, and we would talk about one of the chapters. And Granny was always asked to do the prayer, because that's our protocol, and I can remember just, oh, geez, they're going to ask Granny to say the prayer again. Like, just kind of embarrassed about it because she would stand up, make the sign of the cross, bless us, O oh Lord, for these gifts, and finish her prayer, make the sign of the cross, and set back down. And uh, we were in the midst of questioning what does it mean to be Shawetm? How would we have prayed in a traditional Shawetm way? in the language, most likely, because that's the only language they knew. And so Granny, despite being fluent in Shawetmachjin, in Shushwap, did not know how to pray in the language. She would pray in, in the language, but it was, there was a priest that uh, learned the language and translated the, uh, the, Catholic prayers into Shawetm. So she would say those in the language, but not in a, like the way we uh, learn to pray now to, you know, grandmothers, the grandfather's creator. Um, uh, she didn't know how to pray in that way. So fast forward a little bit, Granny ends up in uh, Kamloops Hospital. She's 95. She's asking for a priest. It's like, oh, geez, Granny's going to die. Uh, where she's asking for the priest and we're divided in our family. Um, some are still Catholic and some want to have, to have nothing to do with it. 
anyway, the priest was called and I happened to be sitting beside granny when he came in and, and I whispered to her, granny, the priest is here. And um, right now he, op he opened the curtains and right now granny sat up despite having a broken hip, got up on her arms and she just belted out, give me strength. And she just started trying to grab the priest's hands and just telling him how much pain she was in and just babbling away. And he's doing, you know, he's thinking the last rites. And um, when I seen that, I realized that I had no right to be judging granny because I used to think, how can you be Catholic after everything that place has done? And um, just be really bitter about it. And uh, yeah, so seeing that, I realized that was granny's strength. We, in the north, Shawetm, down by the Fraser River, the smallpox of 1862 came through. Before that, we had our own ways of being, our own medical, our own judicial, our own... We were in great numbers. 92% got wiped out from the smallpox and the miners discovering gold on the Fraser. Along with it, a lot of our culture, I don't even have an Indian name. On the coast, a lot of the coastal have Indian name, uh, Indian names, and I'm just so envious. And we don't even know the protocol for that. And uh, like with our language, and so we are really, it's getting better, like I'm speaking for myself, culturally poor, myself, my son and my grandchildren, even less uh, culture and language. Um, so yeah, so that's the story of uh, when granny passed. We, I know all the, all the prayers, so we were holding hands when, when granny passed and I helped my aunt say the Catholic prayers. So great respect for granny when she passed. I was a young mom. I was pregnant when I was 12. I um, had a boy take interest in me. I didn't know what was happening, but it was good to have somebody in, interested in me and actually like hugging me because, because of the uh, resident, that's an intergenerational impact because uh, granny had to give her children up uh, at six years old. So at about five years old, she would start to push the child away. And I felt that, and, and my, my aunts and I talked about that, because Granny was good with babies. And I have a picture of her holding my son in a basket that she made. And uh, she was good with babies, but at about five years old, you get pushed away. No more lap, no more hugging, no more singing. You were, because she was preparing her heart to lose her children, as well as preparing us to be in an environment where we did not matter. That's just so heartbreaking. And so the my son's father is from my community. He lives in Williams Lake. And uh, so I had my son on my 14th birthday. My son was four months old. This is me on the left when I was 13. And I think on the right, I was probably maybe 14, just turned 14. And uh, there was never, and I just found this out recently that, because I always thought if my aunt found out I was pregnant, she would have made me get an abortion. But recently she told me that that would have never even been a consideration. And she didn't find out until I was well past the three month mark. And, and, uh, but she took my son in as well. And uh, so he grew up knowing me as his mother. I never did have any more children. And uh, even though I wanted to, and I had tried and it just never happened. And so this is uh, uh, to finish, I'll finish here in five, six minutes. I have um, to tell you, this is my family. It was taken in 2020. 
in Kamloops. Uh, there's my son. And when I present to the, the children, it's um, you got to make stuff like into games or, you know, make it. So I, I tell them to look at my son's hairline and see if you can pick him out <laughs> in the next picture, because there he is. Uh, with his hairline. Um, so for the first time in four generations, my son and his wife are raising their children under the same roof because of residential school in our history. Granny, mom, me, and my son didn't have that. My son was at the last operating residential school in Canada when it closed in Saskatchewan in 1996. And it's also in the Beyond the Orange Shirt story. And my son never seen the inside of a high school. By the grace of God, he is on this side of the, the, of the cell bars. He could have very well ended up in prison. Um, he was a jail guard for many years here in Williams Lake and uh, when he was about 17, because uh, he, he quit school in grade six, I had just started my healing journey in 1994. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was called, and I didn't know what to do about it. I was a mess. But I was determined to raise my son because I was not raised by my mother. And... Um, so I stuck with him no matter what he was. He went to uh, alternate schools like the Friendship Center. And because of one teacher there that made a difference in his life and told him, and I'll get back to the other story here, but um, said, you come at before lunchtime and you have lunch and I, I need from you two full hours of school. And this is the courses you need to get your adult dogwood. And that's something that he could do. He was uh, 18, 19 at the time. Uh, so he got his adult dogwood. What a change that would make. And um, so he, um, yeah, I forgot what, to, oh yes, by the bars. He went downtown one night when he was 17 with some of his friends and they ended up killing a man. All of them got, uh, arrested and my son and his friend chose to sp stay back and play video games. Um, I'm, I can see people coming on now, so I think I have a, just a couple minutes, but I didn't read my orange shirt story, I realized, and but it's on page 12 in the book about how granny bought me the, the shirt and when I got to the mission, what it was like and what it felt like. And the last thing I want to say, or is the woman on the right here with the long hair is my aunt. Her name is Agnes. Her story is in here as well. She's the one that raised me from age 10. This is my mother. Uh, she lives in Kamloops, my five grandchildren, uh, my son's wife. She stays home and watches the children. And behind me here is my biological father. I found him in uh, uh, 2018 through Ancestry DNA. And there's a uh, the story is in here as well. And I just recently, uh, about th three weeks ago, got my biological father added to my birth certificate. Because I, I like, I like history. And I thought 100 years from now, somebody might be wondering, who was Phyllis's father? <laughs> so I got it added to my uh, birth certificate. It was quite the process. But I, uh, yeah, so I hope that I that was a lot to talk about and I could have expanded more but I have a half an hour my presentations are usually an hour um, and I hope to meet some of you in person someday and Gukshem thank you all for what you do in education and um, hoping my story might help you with uh, your students. Um, my eldest grandson here, he's 17 and he's in grade 11 and really struggling. He's, um, uh, we're hoping to meet with his school counselor, but um, he is intergenerationally affected. And uh, his mother is a resident, his, her, her father went to residential school. She grew up on eggshells, so she's really affected. And um, 
uh, the, the second grandson, he turns 13 next week, has real trouble with reading, but it's the family, it's the family unit has come together after four generations and it's not going to be perfect. They are living in a city. They might be homeless soon. It just breaks my heart, but that's another story. The house they're living in is selling and in Kamloops a house is half a million dollars now. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, it's, there's just a lot that, like my son there he's trying he's working and he's you know trying to navigate being a parent and the education system and you know his wife with the what she goes through being a, a survivor like a intergenerational and my son and you know it's 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 a lot and um if there's anything I can stress is that it's yeah it's apocalyptic that's a word somebody told me uh, recently that what Indigenous people are experiencing right now is apocalyptic. So you add the COVID and you add the, like we have, our people are dropping here in Williams Lake from drugs and um, we deal with that as well. So anyway, Cookstam, thank you for listening and I will um, answer questions now. So Cookstam, thank you. Hi, Phyllis. Um, I'm just looking, Phyllis, at, first of all, I don't want you to feel rushed at all. So I, I, we always have questions, but I want you to, I want to make sure that you know that there's space here to talk about whatever you still have to talk about. There's no rush at all. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to let you know that there are lots of comments coming in now and they're all saying thank you and acknowledging your um, courage and your resilience. And I know you, ha I, when I asked you when we first met, um, are you resilient? What did you say? <laughs> yeah, <sighs> yeah, I don't want to be. Um, I'm not on other platforms on social media, but I'm on Facebook and I see, I like the sayings, but um, one of them was, um, I don't want to be resilient and taking hits all the time and always having to be um, better than or trying to prove myself or, you know, always getting back up. Like, I, I want some ease. I want life to be a little bit. I have, I hope, another 20 some years of life left. Like, I want some ease. I want some, you know, some slack. And, um, it's tiring being resilient and it's, it's not a good way to be. And, and uh, for me, it's, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I suppose we are, well, we are resilient with everything we've gone through, but darn it, like, we, it's, it shouldn't, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what reconciliation is about is about the two worlds. Cause we all live in two worlds as indigenous people our Indigenous world and the non-Indigenous world. And uh, we live in the non, the non-Indigenous don't always know what our world is like. So, um, yeah, so that was my, my response to, to that. I wonder when, when thank you for that. Um, it made me think a lot. I, I uh, uh, after you said that, you can just accept the, the title of resilience you you had some qualifiers around that um have you experienced any of that peace or any of that space um since since you've started telling your story and because there's two things that happen when i hear your story one is so much gratitude that you're telling your story but another is my wondering about what is it like for you to tell your story mm -hmm. yeah i uh started doing orange shirt stuff um, full time in April of 2019. So just a little over three years ago. And we opened an office at the same time. 
we people think that we are government funded and that we have offices in every province and you know we have this big organization but last year it was me my i think me uh, my cousin um that was working with me she moved and was wanting to do something else so it was just me in the office and um I reluctantly accepted the title of executive director because we we were relying on what I could make doing presentations and shirt sales and donations, and we still do. Um, but with 215, it's uh, open people's minds and hearts, and uh, we're at a staff now of six full-time and one part-time. And But with that... What I, I learned is forming and storming is a part of the, um, there's forming, storming, norming, and performing. So we've been in the forming, storming. And just because we didn't have, you know, all of the policies, we didn't have the procedures, we didn't, you know, we've got to work, how, figure out how to work with each other, with people, you know, some in the office and some remotely and with everything that we're trying to do. And it's hard. And then, uh, I recently started traveling again, and um, that like to get anywhere from Williams Lake, it takes two days. Like <laughs> we got to go to Vancouver and then uh, fly out of Vancouver, and so it like if I go anywhere for a speaking, it's two trap like four travel days for maybe one speaking event. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. That that was the one thing about being able to work from our own homes. We didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. We could, uh, yeah. Uh, one, one of um, the things I'm thinking about is that, that we are 235 educators, people working in the area of mental health in schools who are, who are here today. And um, wh why, why do you do this? What are you hoping that they and I will take away from your story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just kind of happened. And I'm doing my best to step up to what's happening. And but why I do it is my grandchildren. I always bring it back to my own story. And I want their lives to be easier, more at ease, more dif different than what I've had to deal with with because um, I'm I'm half indigenous so like I haven't dealt with the racism that my like my cousins that are full and darker have to deal with and but when I went to go apply for a loan I was asked um, or it was assumed that I was on welfare and I wanted to purchase the local travel agency even though I had a business plan that I had worked on and I'm educated in that area none of that was asked about and I didn't like I didn't know what was happening it was a person that was my age and then um, the people that owned the travel agency were going to support me even put the building up as collateral and they were going to train me and so they talked to them the, the bank person and so she called me back in and then the next question she asked or she asked me was um do you people file tax returns <laughs> do you people so with my grandchildren learning uh, and their peers uh, orange shirt day is in schools all across Canada corporates people are learning about the history of residential schools and, and the impacts it's having and learning truths of survivors um, that they will have a different perspective than that bank manager that was the same age as I was. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, oh my goodness, I went to um, Royal Bank recently and uh, the woman, she was uh, like a, a younger like long blonde hair and you know beautiful tall and skinny and and um she treated me like a human being it was so nice um she was chatting she said she you know had taken some courses in school and and you know was just conversation whereas yeah. like a lot of times you go in there and you know, you just looked at and asked questions like you're not a 
a person, right? It, it really felt good to be looked at as a person in her eyes and what a difference. I was gonna ask you how that felt to feel like a person. Yeah, it's, um, it's some of that ease that I'm talking about. Like life was just a little bit easier. Help me to get. I don't know where that's coming from. But. Wow, uh, the word ease is a powerful word, actually. When you said it, I had some feelings as well. What brings you ease? What, you know, you're not asking for a lot in this world. You're asking for some ease. And um, so interesting that story about that bank teller, because that's not a huge act. That's not changing the world. That was this human being being human. Yeah. Yeah. Like and I'm talking to a bank. Um, and sharing with them my experience because um, business and it, it is my like accounting and that is my education and um, like I've worked my entire life and um, to be yeah and then to struggle and to like I've only been on welfare three months of my life and you know to be treated that way like I'm trying, I'm trying to, you know, trying to make a difference for me and my family and to be just knocked down and pummeled on. And, you know, mm -hmm. But to go in with this blonde manager uh, for, for a loan to do some stuff and to be treated like that, that was amazing. I just want to share with you one of the messages that came in. Phyllis, you are a light maker. Your story and mission have transformed our national landscape. You are valued and appreciated. Much love to you. Mm -hmm. So I hear you. Your priority is that you think about your grandchildren. I get that. I'm a grandma. I'm a Nona too. And I wonder how often you get to really let it sink in, Phyllis, that you are a light maker for so many people, young and old, that shines on September 30th, but other times too. Does that, how does that land for you? I'm gonna write that down. That's, I've never heard that before. Light. You are a light maker. Yeah, it's, um, I just get up every day, do what I can for to today. Sometimes I don't think I can continue. It's like, I, I don't think I can do this. But here I am coming in. Um, I was still brushing my teeth when um, Whitney called and said I was supposed to be on for a tech check. It's like, oh, well, hello, this is Whitney. I have a toothbrush in my mouth and I'm um, trying to get out of the house to get to the office. And but well, you clean up real good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I, I got a text, Phyllis check in and it's like, okay, and I get to the office and something's happening. I got to talk to my son. Okay, I'm here. So, but it's, it's not, you know, nice and smooth all the time. It's, yeah. and I still, my breakfast is, you know, it's half eaten. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, there's a human, well, you know, I'm, I'm human, just like everybody else. And yeah. I have no training in this. Our president was saying, like, how do you do it? And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I just take it each day as it comes, I guess. Well, you speak with many thousands of people and and you tell your story and we hear today that this isn't a simple and an easy thing to do. And it makes um, us even more appreciative that you've taken the time to do this with us today with your breakfast half eaten, mm -hmm. like your teeth half brushed, mm -hmm. how much impact you have, um, not just today, but mm -hmm. but every day. Um, yeah, and I usually have earrings um, that I wear, but I couldn't find it in my office because I've been traveling and I've been just, I've been helping my cousin, Granny's oldest. She's been in a homeless shelter with her four children for about three months. So I've been helping her the last couple of nights. Um, I, was, I brought my car in to get the tires changed and I forgot the tires at home, you know, like stuff like that. Right. I'm just... no, no earrings, no <laughs> earrings necessary. Phyllis, are you going to make a movie? I heard you say you're going to make a movie. 
Probably at some point. Um, I haven't been approached, but yeah, probably it, um, it'll happen. I can happen. see why. Yeah. As a, as a documentary producer, I can see why you'd want to do that. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, now you can go finish your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hope that you get a chance to come on to the main um, platform where we are, because I'd, I'd love it if you could just read through and really absorb the, mm -hmm. the, the gratitude that's there for you. Um, such a privilege to be able to hear your story, people are saying. So thank you so much. And mm -hmm. um, please do hang around. And if you want to send us a picture of you with your earrings on, that would be great too. Yeah.